on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. I'm 51 now. 10% of the books I read, I don't finish these days because I get three or four chapters in and I think that that structure isn't there or it's being self-indulgent or whatever. And I think uh, I, I'm not going to read all the books I want to read before I die. So I put it, put it down and I'll start something else. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It's The Self-Publishing Show with James Blatch. And Mark Dawson. Resplendent in your book, Bob T-shirt, and your... I, I don't know if people can see your bare legs, because I can't see the shot that people can see. You can't. You can see my bare legs, but no one else can. I, this is kind of the new, the newsreader shot. It's... Uh, I, know, I love talking about the weather. I don't care if people criticise me. I'm British, and I will talk about the bloody weather. It is 33 degrees, which in, in American money is 90-something today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm it's wearing, pretty hot here as well. I'm wearing my Nashville T-shirt. I'm assuming it's a T-shirt that keeps you cool. Well, I mean, I certainly look cool in it, that's for sure. <laughs> Debatable, yes. Long pause. Uh, in honour of our friend Dave Chesson and everybody else who lives in Nashville. Who else lives in Nashville? I think that, yes, I probably shouldn't say, because I think somebody's daughter lives in Nashville and a few other people, and it's a fun place to be. Little book crowd there. Um, yeah, we are uh, ploughing on through the summer months and ploughing on still through COVID, which is refusing to go away. Uh, in Europe, there's talk about a second wave. In America, they still seem to be cresting the first wave. So all the things we've talked about over previous weeks about uh, market changes are all still relevant. And we would say to people, I guess, Mark, stay vigilant, keep an eye on the figures and react. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm actually looking at buying stock on Amazon at the moment because yeah. they put their figures out. All the tech companies put their figures out yesterday, didn't they? And, and they were all... They're all very strong figures, and Amazon had a forty percent bigger revenue for this quarter just gone as the comparative quarter last year. Um, yeah. So yeah, Amazon stock is probably obviously I'm not I'm not an advisor. I'm certainly not no. not qualified to, to tell anything anyone about anything um, about buying stock, but it's certainly one that's uh, I think might be quite interesting. I do tiny bits of dabbling in stock, and I'm terrible at it. Really, I'm always or even. I think the only way to buy stock if you're someone like me is to invest a couple of hundred quid and then forget about it for five years. And over five mm-hmm. years, you should, unless the company goes bust. But I bought Tesla Slack, which we use a productivity tool. And I thought that would go up because home working and so on. Something called Workhorse that a mate told me to buy. And IAG, who own British Airways now, which sounds like an unusual one, but they really bottomed out. And I thought in mm-hmm. the long run, they are going to be one of the survivors. And mm-hmm. so I think it's a long-term thing. But I've lost money on all of them. Even Slack and Tesla. Oh, Tesla's a funny one, isn't it? It's, um, but yeah, Apple, it's all-time high yesterday, weren't they? Uh, as you say, the stocks, the, uh, the digital stocks coming out. Um, yeah. And I suppose the pure indie companies, I mean, you're wearing a BookBub t-shirt. There's a few other pure indie companies are at this stage. I don't think any of them are publicly listed. They're all sort of privately owned organizations, but in the long run will be bought by PLCs or will become PLCs. It'd be interesting in a few years time that we can invest in the um, properly invest because at the moment it's a select band of people get invited to either start a company themselves or invest in somebody else's. But it would be nice to be buy some shares in BookBub or, you know, one of the big uh, sort of indie organizations, maybe in, even SPF PLC. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we'll see about that. No, it's uh, well, book. Well, do you listen to the podcast? I know we know that, don't we? So you never know. We, we might get a um, might get an email next week with Invite some, us some to invest. options. Yeah. yeah, well, I tell you what, if I invest, it might be the kiss of death. You should, uh, yeah, you should invest. Exactly. Send it to me, not not to you, <laughs> not to me. Okay, look, uh, let us welcome some Patreon uh, supporters. The shout outs for this week go to Monique Elton and Travis Zenzaki and Dad FC. Dad FC. Dad, I think FC. I think that's the book. I, I think I don't remember ah. the author's name, but I've seen in in the SPF community today or yesterday um, a, a cover with Dad FC, and I think that that may be that may be it. And I thought the cover was quite good. So um, yes, good luck with that one. So in the UK, that would be football club, Dad football club, as in mm-hmm. AFL or whatever. What what do you what are the letters after the name of uh, 
the Miami Dolphins. AFL, is it? No, N- well, NFL. NFL, it, but, um, yeah. yeah. But that's the league. It's not the. It doesn't. It doesn't. No. It doesn't mean the club. But we have. I don't a, think they have. A, they don't have. They an have FC an equivalent. equivalent. No. Association Football Club. We still. Some clubs are still AFC. On AFC Wimbledon Association Football Club. Wimbledon. Bournemouth AFC. Yeah. Bournemouth AFC. Poor Bournemouth. They went down, didn't they? Poor mm-hmm. Bournemouth. Right. Enough chitter chatter. We have Ian Sainsbury on this week. I have to be careful because I have called him Ian Salisbury almost his whole life. And it's funny, he said to me, everyone, <laughs> everyone calls him Ian Salisbury. He's not really sure why. But he uh, is... Do you know, I, that's, that's in my head as well. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. weird, isn't it? It is weird. Weird one. Um, but he is Ian Sainsbury, as in the supermarket chain here in the UK. But as far as he can tell, and he's done some digging, he's not related because they're a minted family. Um, but Ian Sainsbury, we first came across Ian, well, you first came across him when you were the judge on the Kindle Storyteller Awards here in the UK three years ago, I want to say, two or three years no, ago. Oh, last year. Last year. Oh, Ian was last mm-hmm. year. I thought uh, well, our friend from Sydney was last year. Anyway, she may have been the year before. Okay, so Ian was last year. And lo and behold, he only went and won, um, Ian, didn't he? With a, a he good did. book. Very good book. Yes, he did. Um, yeah, it was, it was, I think, four or five books came to us as the judges to read and there were some really good books actually um a, a good selection and and ian's i felt was um was was a particularly good one and very pleased to see him um uh, to you know on the uh the awards night or the the night that the prize was awarded i was watching because obviously i knew he was about to get his name called and i was watching him and his wife as mariella frostrup who's the, uh, the kind of the celebrity judge that year called his name out and it was really lovely um really lovely he was bowled over i think and his wife burst into tears so it was just it was just lovely moments and he's a really nice guy so yeah I'm very i was very happy for him and and it's it's completely deserving really good book yeah called well, the, the picture on the fridge yes very good book now what's worth talking about and the reason we've had in or not just because of that success the fact he's a good writer is understanding how to make money, you know, how to commercialize your writing if that's what you want to do, because simply writing a lovely book might not be enough. We know that there are some strategies in terms of series and, and also the type of genre fiction that sells in large numbers might be higher selling than literary fiction and so on. So all these things factor in. And Ian is somebody who's been very thoughtful about this, wants to write what he wants to write, wants to write what he loves reading, but at the same time wants a better commercial career out of it. So he's put some thought into this. And um, without preempting the interview too much, he came up with a very interesting strategy, didn't he? We, of of breaking, going for genre fiction and then breaking it down, almost designing it around, I think, the Kindle Unlimited model. Yeah, short, shorter fiction. So he followed the Dean Koontz Nameless series model. So this was um, Dean Koontz published with Thomas and Mercer, maybe six um, short 20,000 word novellas that were all all with the same character very nicely stylized the covers look great they're all very colorful they look the same and that um obviously I had the Amazon marketing machine behind it but those those books appeared to clean up they were very highly ranked for a long time and they're still they're still highly ranked today so um, I think Ian looked at that and and to be honest I've looked at that too I think there is that kind of more serialized shorter reads um there is no reason why that shouldn't be effective but it's apart from a kind of a, in the early days that that did work a little bit and i'm thinking of people like sean platt and um dave wright with their yesterday's gone series although that wasn't quite the same but in, in a similar kind of fashion um it's, it hasn't really taken off since then um and i don't know why that is i'm, I'm i find that quite a curious one but anyway um Ian is having a crack at that himself um, with his um, Bedlam Boy series, which I've I've read and enjoyed, um, and I hope that it works for him. Yeah. Okay. Let's hear from Ian. This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Well, I, I like your background as the background of an artist. Well, that's true. You you can't see the piano. That's on that side. I can see the piano. No, that's oh. the keyboard. Oh, that's the keyboard. Sorry. So that's a. Uh... Yeah, Archuria master keyboard for, for linking up to iPad stuff and the iMac for Logic, and then the piano, acoustic piano is over here. Okay. Right. Well, <laughs> there's instruments everywhere. There's a cajon. A what? Cajon. Yeah, sort of Spanish drum. You sit on. Okay. 
That's a, that's not a box there. That's a. Cajon. Oh yes, yes. I've seen seen someone playing that. I remember there was a Dido video of someone sitting on playing that, and I wondered if it was just a box he was sitting on playing. But now I know oh, it's a no. cajon. There you go. Yeah, another lo- lovely little instrument that is. So that's almost like the instrument I could probably play. One you just sit on and tap. This is the great thing about it. Yeah, not if you can't play it, you've always yeah. what you've got is a slightly expensive stool. Yes. Well, look, here we are. I think we can start the uh, the interview with us waffling at the beginning. It's an intriguing beginning to uh, <laughs> to Ian Sainsbury, who I keep wanting to call Salisbury. We've just explained that I'm not the only one who does that because Sainsbury is a very famous supermarket brand in the UK. And um, for whatever reason, it confuses our minds. But you are Ian Sainsbury, not related to the supermarket. No, not at all, unfortunately. But you are an author, and you're an author who was recognised and picked up. Uh, last year, was it that you won the Kindle... Uh, remind me of the name of the competition. It's the Kindle... Kindle Storyteller Award. Kindle Storyteller Award. Uh, and I think where they are open for submissions as we speak, I think up until August. I should probably have looked all this up before we got going, but if you... Yeah, look, me too. <laughs> yeah, if you Google King, Kindle Storyteller Award. Now, this is... Um, an award that uh, the likes of uh, LJ Ross, Mark Dawson, I think Claudia Winkleman, is that right, this year? are. Um, I think Marietta Frostrop in the past has been a judge, so they're quite famous people in the UK. So it's, it's a literary award. It's an award we love because it's geared around people who upload their books to Amazon, generally independent publishers. And um, there's a gala night, and you went along. Did you have any idea that you might win? I know everyone says no, um, but it genuinely was no. And I can I can almost sort of prove it because on the train on the way down, I was with my wife, Ruth, and uh, I was so convinced that I, that I wouldn't win that I said, look, if I do, there's this ridiculous piece of musical equipment that I've always fancied owning, which is it's a, a little keyboard called the OP1. It's massively overpriced, beautiful piece of equipment. And I'd always fancied having one. I said, I'll tell you what, if I win, um, I'll get one of those. And she went, yeah, yeah, good idea. And I thought, right, okay, now. Because she was safe in the knowledge. She obviously yeah, she, thought you wouldn't knew, win either. Yeah. She knew it wasn't happening because I'd already explained, you know, that it, was, uh, it wasn't it wasn't going to happen, but we were going to have a nice night out and a few drinks, Swish Hotel, you know. And uh, so, what? I mean, there's a great photo from the night, if you think I'm kidding, uh, where it's got my, my wife, when, just after she burst into tears, and, um, and my face which is it's an unfakeable expression where the, the jaw shock. has dropped open. <laughs> well, that's uh, well, that's delightful that um, that you got through. So you you this is a competition that you do have to enter. Uh, so you have to submit for it. So you obviously thought you were in the ring, and at some point you get a notification you've been shortlisted, which must have been your first shock. Yeah, um, and I, I mean it's such an easy competition to enter. They make it easy for you because you just replace one of your keywords on the upload page with Kindle Storyteller 2019 or 2020 this year. Uh, But it's one of those things, I suppose it's like, it's even less effort than buying a lottery ticket, but uh, which I don't do, but you just think, well, I might as well. It's just using one of my keywords and someone's got to win it, right? You know, Uh, and then you forget all about it because it's months later and it must have been early September, I think, when I got a an email from Darren Hardy, who heads up Kindle UK. Well, you know Darren. Yes. Well, we know Darren. he's been on, been on the show. Uh, lovely guy. And I thought, I mean, actually, I, I thought, well, I, it must be the shortlist because there's no other reason why <laughs> why he would want to talk to me. Why on earth would, <laughs> would he want to talk to me? So I did think that must be it. And he called me uh, when I was driving and I pulled over and, and yeah, he said, yeah, you're on a shortlist. You can't talk about it for for a week until we get the press release out and I didn't know who else was on it um and that's at the point when I looked for the first time at the at the storyteller page and saw how many pages it was of entries and how many thousands and, and thought oh this is ridiculous uh but they also had some featured entries um and I looked at all of them and I thought well they, they all look great and one of them I'd read three of his books already right uh, Queeve McDonnell, uh, great comic thriller. So that was when I relaxed at that point because I thought, well, I love his stuff. He's great. So <laughs> I expect he'll win. And um, I just started practicing my my game face, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, You're bra- like, brave. Like, 
Yeah, slightly well done. disappointed, but yes. yeah, got to acknowledge that it was a terrific book. But know. then he sat there and on the night, uh, it was a memorable night actually for us because I think we saw Jamie Lee Curtis in the bar when I, I went down to interview Louise before she and Mark hobnobbed it off to the awards. I went then home dressed in my jeans and T-shirt, but in the bar of the hotel was Jamie Lee Curtis and uh, Christopher Guest. Actually, I'm not sure if Christopher Guest was there. But anyway, that's that's my memory from the night. Your memory from the night is sitting there and hearing your name read out and then being shocked. So, yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis and Christopher Guest would have done... That would have been the icing on the cake. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a huge Spinal Tap fan. So. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, okay, well, look, let's talk a little bit about your writing, uh, Ian. And this is obviously a, a, a fantastic achievement for you to be recognised like this. And that, like, as you say... Lots and lots of entries. I have no idea how they even begin the process of whittling it down, but I know it's taken very seriously. And I know that the judges uh, have a lot of discussion and deliberation about this and a lot of thought goes into this. So this was not, you know, this was not a lottery. There was not a drawing of a name out of a hat. This was a a, a meritor- meritorious uh, award for you. So well done on that. Um, so when, when did writing start for you? Um, and at what point has it become your main focus? Um, well, I, th- I think like probably like most writers, when I was young, I, I, it was always a, an option in my head somewhere because I love reading so much. And when you're an obsessive reader like I was, uh, I think there's always part of you that thinks, I wonder if I could, if I could do this because yeah, it's just what a way to earn a living, you know. But uh, music was always my, my my biggest strength way in my mind. Anyway, I, my dad's a musician. My grandfather was a a drummer ran a band in Bristol um so I ended up going into into music uh, which is what I always wanted to do and the and the writing I suppose it became part of that really I wrote music and uh I wrote songs and then uh worked as a musician for decades uh and ended up doing stand-up comedy for a few years as well wow. so that's where the writing came back I suppose because I had to sit down and, and, and write a set you know, so um, I wrote jokes and uh, sort of short comedy songs. Um, I used to walk on stage with a keyboard around my neck, uh, which wasn't one of those keyboards, like a key tar, it was a light one. This was a proper heavy right. keyboard that I did, that had holes drilled into. So uh killed my shoulder. It's a good job comedy sets are only 20 minutes long. But I suppose that's when the writing came back again. And it gave, I think that gave me confidence because... Uh, that went pretty well. And uh, I also wrote material for other people. Um, I suppose the most famous of which is Paul Zerdin, who won America's Got Talent season 10. He's a, an old friend of mine. Um, I co-wrote his his show and all the music for it. Um, and it's actually, when I, when he was at, in Vegas, with, that was his prize, was a, a Vegas show you know, wow. the following year. So he was out doing that. And I was there for the first six weeks and that was when I'd finally written my first novel uh, the year before and put it out just to, I think about three or four weeks before we went to Vegas so it was just then when I was out of that I started to see the dashboard for the first time and started to see sales coming in and uh, and it was it actually did the first book did pretty well quite quickly so while I was out there I thought well I, I better write another one I'd written the first as a standalone but I'd left it a bit open so so I started uh, writing the second one. Yeah, just everything went really well, uh, quickly enough for me to think, well, I, I'll give the music a break for a while. Yeah. And uh, I'm still on the break. Yeah. And, and later, the stand-up anyway. break as well? Yeah, well, the stand-up I did for about three and a half years. That was back 2003-ish, I think. Um, and I really enjoyed it, but I was doing about 40,000 miles a year. Wow. Um, and young, uh, well, at that time, just one one kid, but very young, and I didn't enjoy that side of it so much. No. Uh, so I decided I'd stick to the, I'd carry on writing bits and pieces, but I wouldn't go out and, and gig anymore. So I did the occasional thing. Right. Uh, the last one was a, about three or four years ago, but uh, no, it's that the, the keyboard's been sold. Oh, with <laughs> the, 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 the holes that, in it. I say that, yeah, that one's gone. There's a, there's still another five in the house, yeah. so it's, uh, you know, it could still I, happen. But and of course, another one since you won the uh, Kindle Storyteller Award. Yes, um, yeah. So the first novel, what was it, and 
how did you decide what it was you were going to write? Uh, the first one's called The World Walker, and that's a, a sci-fi novel. And I think I decided on that because probably my absolute love for reading was in my teens, like most people. That's when I was really reading loads. And at that point, I was reading loads of Ray Bradbury and Ursula Le Guin and Robert Heinlein and Asimov. And, uh, so it was a lot of science fiction, which I then... I've always kept reading science fiction, but not as avidly as I did then. But I think it's just when I sat down to write the ideas I'd start to jot down, a lot of them were very on the speculative side and on the sci-fi side. Uh, and it just gave me, it just gave me a real, a, 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 I suppose the broadest possible canvas at that point. I had so many ideas, James. Yeah, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Right. So many ideas. I could, that's always been, I've always said my ideal job would be someone paid me just to sit down and have ideas, which kind of is what writing is. So uh, it was, it, I think I probably had 25, 30 ideas written down, just basic ones that I could have expanded into a novel. And then I heard an interview with uh, uh, James Burke, if you remember him from the... Yes, the TV presenter yeah. scientist guy. That's it, yeah. He did an interview in the... 80s early 80s i think uh for on radio 4 where they asked him to predict things over the next 30 years and he got a lot of it right including social media he was pretty he said people would be willing to give up their their privacy yeah give information willingly you know and, and which must have sounded pretty weird at the time but yeah. he was right and now we do it every day of the week yeah exactly yeah and he they asked him back on and i heard that interview and that so that must have been 2015 i should imagine and said what about the next 30 years uh, and his big thing was nanotechnology uh right and he said because we could end up in a society of abundance rather than a shortage you know uh, where everybody's got more than enough which is a lovely idea because you could make anything you need out of these easily available elements and with nanotechnology anybody could live anywhere they could eat anything so uh i my, my cynical side said that sounds amazing, but what if that technology was already here and people, some people knew about it, they wouldn't be sharing it. And and that was the spark uh, okay. that started the, the book. Is that also the, um, that led to theories of the, of the gray glue, uh, gray, gr what was it? Gray goo. That was it. Have you ever heard that? The gray goo? The gray goo. So I think, I'm surprised you don't know. I think if I've got this right, that when people first started talking about nanotechnology, these tiny little machines that were, you know, for initially, I think we're not that far away from them being able to clean windows and things. But if they got a reproductive element to them, which they'd probably need to sustain themselves, there would be an inevitable point where they would take over the planet and just cover us in a yard, a meter of grey goo, because we wouldn't be able to stop them reproducing and we'd all die. Uh, that was uh, one of the theories. But anyway, I think Prince Charles once lashed onto that. We should also say about James Burke, if people want to know who James Burke is, they need to look on the internet and Google James Burke rocket piece to camera, because it, why well, have you seen this in? It was the greatest television piece to camera in the history of television. It's an absolutely incredible... He's, he's an amazing TV presenter, but if you look up, we'll, we'll, go, we'll get Alexandra to um, put it in the show notes because it's always worth a watch. You want to see how television was done properly back in the uh, in the 70s. Okay, so J James Burke, very inspirational guy, actually, to me as well, the more I think about him. And you had these these ideas going around. So you wrote your sci-fi book. Looks great, actually. Cover looks uh, intriguing, a fantastic blurb. And in those days, so remind me what year this was you uploaded this? That's Mar end of March 2016 end of March 2016 you uploaded it did you yep. do anything else well first of all did you think about getting an agent or querying and, and a, a tr trad prop a contract no. um I had a f a friend uh called Murray McDonald and he wrote thrillers so he's Scottish he was living in Norfolk and he wrote American uh political thrillers obviously and uh, he'd had for. quite a bit of success and they were all standalones and I knew absolutely nothing about about this but he encouraged me when i said you know, i'd always fancied writing a book which i'm sure well i know pretty much everybody says yeah. he, he encouraged me and i imagine he encouraged me the way i encourage people when they say that which is it's genuine but you think well i'll never hear from them again yeah um but i i did do it and he could see i was you know i was saying oh 
got, you know, I've got 40,000 words or whatever. And he started to take more of an interest. And it was him who, because I think I've, I'd seen, he talked to me about his experience. It didn't even cross my mind to go to find an agent or go to a publisher. And I'm not quite sure why it was nothing about, I didn't think one was better than the other. I just thought this is, I, I can write this and I can put it out there and maybe, I, I mean, I was, optimistic and ambitious I thought yeah a few hundred people might read it and in which case they might there might be a few of those who really like it and that would be a, that would be good and I yeah there was a part of me that thought actually as I was writing it I thought this is better than I'd hoped you know it was uh okay it was it was good the, the writing was I mean I can't bring myself to read it now and that's I don't want to put anyone off it it's not that at all it's uh I don't reread anything mm. I feel like this is a new way of building a career in a way so I've that first book is always going to be my first book it's full of it's absolutely bursting with ideas and enthusiasm and excitement and there are some passages in it I'm proud of but it's you know it's it's just whoa here's mm. everything I'm thinking and it's mm. uh but it really grabbed people I think it was that excitement mm. and enthusiasm in the writing that that got people to enthuse about it and you know word of mouth did its well, trick it's got, somehow it's got 739 reviews on amazon.co.uk at 4.6 out of 5 average which is outstanding so uh, obviously it is a, a loved book um and in terms of of your sort of ex you obviously had no experience of writing a novel so how mm. did you approach the structure and i mean it, you obviously read a lot so is that basically where this came from yeah, I think all of us who who read an awful lot, which I, I did. I mean, when I was working in piano bars in Norway, I, before the Kindle came out, I used to take five, six books with me from charity shops, or thrift stores, or, you know, say, in, in America, and that they used to go with me on the plane. And I used to leave them, when I finished reading them, I'd tuck them in the back of the plane, a seat in front or in a restaurant in Norway or in a hotel room so that other people could pick them up. But this was uh, an expensive hobby of mine but um so I think structure just seeps into when it's done well and when it's done badly uh and of course I'm interested in writing and creating always have been so mm. um and if you write songs structure is extremely important it's when it's not only knowing why you need structure and, and how it works it's knowing when you can safely deviate from it in an interesting way yeah and trust the reader to go with you or the listener I mean, all the greatest songs, uh, or most, uh, have got that element of familiarity and something that's slightly different in there, and the, which you might, the first time you listen, you will notice it. But if, uh, a really good example is Yesterday by the Beatles. Mm -hmm. it's a, that's a seven-bar phrase, that song. Now, every 98% of pop songs go in eight-bar phrases. You know, if you've heard the expression middle eight, that's because it's yeah. an eight bar phrase in the middle of a song. Um, so the seven bar phrase is quite unusual, but we don't hear it anymore. And you don't listen to yesterday and think, but there's anything missing at the end of the phrase because it's gone past that stage where you think, oh, there's something a bit different about it. And it's become a classic in its own right. So it's, I think in the same way that you listen to lots of music and you, you adapt the structure, uh, you do the same as a become from a reader to a writer. Yeah. So it became, but, almost became it, it was innate with you. You'd read so well, much. You... Yeah, I was going to say it's that's definitely that's the starting point. But then you have to be constantly uh, checking your own structure and and knocking it and thinking is that actually working? Uh, and that's the after the first draft, going back and yeah. reading through and thinking, well, hang on, actually being able to put the editing head on and think I've got it. I can lose you know, 3000 words here or that chapter just, you know, why is it there? Yeah. Um, and be able to, uh, to do that. I'll say that's, you know, I'm, I'm 51 now. I probably 10% of the books I read, I don't finish these days because I get three or four chapters in and I think they, that, that structure isn't there that, that or it's being self-indulgent or whatever. And I think, uh, I, I'm not going to read all the books I want to read before I die. So I put it, right. put it down and I'll yeah. start something else. Um, and your, um, your book garnered reviews and readers and in terms of sales. 
Yeah, it did. Um, I mean, like I say, I knew nothing, so I had nothing to compare it to. Uh, I was on no forums. Uh, I hadn't. It, it took me. I did everything backwards. I think it, towards the end of my first series, I started to realize there was a community out there. So, so I didn't know what was good, what was bad, what was expected, what wasn't, uh, what I should be working on, and um, sales. I think the second month it was out, it, I remember it made me two thousand quid. Wow, the first book, and uh, of course, yeah, and knowing now what I know, if someone said that to me, I'd go, whoa, you know, you. You better get right in the next one. Go plan a series. Get on with it. Yeah. But at the time, I thought, oh, that's that's good, isn't it? You know, yeah. <laughs> that's that's nice. <laughs> Blimey! I, I just thought, well, that so that will tail off. Um, but it'd be nice to write another one. And I, I remember thinking, if I could write three books a year, and they could make me six grand a piece, then you know, it wouldn't be a living but it'd be worth doing. I'd be able to justify the time I spent writing them financially. Um, I wouldn't feel like I was robbing my children of their inheritance by, by indulging something that I, I love doing. Um, but yeah, they did a lot better than that. And as the second book and the third book came out, um, I think when the fourth one was on pre-order, that was when it was really doing well. Um, and I was having five figure months of, at, at that point without um, with, without doing much marketing or i hear the disbelief in your voice Jim. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and again knowing what i know now um I, I i can only echo that but i did the first book went went up and i did what no one should do which is you you tell your friends and family who of course are going to buy it but they you know all they're also bought so gardening and uh yeah <laughs> or whatever else it's not going to help you uh, but somehow it, the word spread. And I suppose this is to do with, it must've sold a certain amount in the, the first few hours and maybe Amazon just put it in front of a few sci-fi readers. And it, I think it was, it had a lot of tropes in there that people were happy to see, but it also completely upended a lot of them. And they, they were really pleased to have that original take on, on some, some old tropes. So, I think it was good old word of mouth and Amazon algorithm catching that Did somehow. Right. Yeah. Uh, I haven't been able to reproduce it in quite that same way. Okay. Um, but now, like I say, it's all backwards. But And this, now is, I'm... this is science fiction, which a lot of people do say is a more difficult genre to sell. And they look enviously across at the romance and thriller writers. But you, you obviously hit something with this series. You went on, I can see there's four books in the series. Mm -hmm. um, yeah the world walker series uh so you finished that in 2017 and by the end by by book four what sort of um state were you in in terms of the finances did this now look like it was a full-time job for you oh yeah yeah definitely um i think by the time i was writing book three i thought yeah this could i should be putting my energies into this uh so I think, yeah, it was about a year to a year and a half after I released the first one that in my head I transferred. I mean, it's a bit different to most people because I hear people on the podcast and uh, people on forums saying, you know, they did the various jobs that they've had, but they kept going while they've been writing or writing on their commute or whatever. Mm. But I was a professional musician or layabout as, as we're known. So... <laughs> It's a, it's a very different lifestyle, I, or I've always been self-employed. I've dabbled with employment, but it's it's not been a good fit for me, really. Um, so I already had that uh, freelance mentality, I suppose. So it wasn't as massive a, a shift. It was just something mentally where I thought, okay, this is my. It, it still took me uh, probably another year before when people asked me what I did. You said writer, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I said writer rather than musician. Yeah. Um, and I still feel like a musician who writes. Fair enough. So so you got to the end of that series and you decided, I think was the point at which you decided to change genre. Well, there was a slight shift at the end of that series. Um, I went and I wrote a superhero trilogy. So that's, but from a sort of science fiction point of view, in a way, that was um, the half hero trilogy. Um, so yeah, superhero, but with explanations. So there's 
there's, there's some some kind of science behind it. I'm not uh, big into three pages of explaining genetic backgrounds to you know why this is going on or, or whatever. I'm much more about the characters and the story and the twists and turns. But there was it, yeah a bit more of a, a science fiction take on on superheroes and also apart from Alan Moore, who's the great um, writer of uh, things like Watchmen and V for Vendetta and uh, From Hell. I, it wasn't much in the way of superheroes in Britain. So this is a British a, superhero. Yeah, yeah, it is. And a kind of alternate timeline idea as well. So okay. Got, it's time the world was saved by a British superhero, I feel. Yeah, well, we've got Doctor Who. Yes. So I'm surprised. I can think of a few points in the last few years where he could have gone back and just yeah. fixed things. Well, I've got a list for him. Or her, well, I think or, we all have. May, you know, yeah. Could definitely start with, re we're starting 2020 again. Um, yeah. So so that, how did the sales go with that? How did that compare with the first series? They, they, would, they never sold as well. But uh, part of that, I think, was most people thought I was American with World Walker because that was another decision I made early on was, uh, again, with... A friend of mine who was writing these political thrillers his were all written in american english and no one guessed he was scottish living in norfolk so i thought yeah good idea so mine was set in i mean i've worked in uh, in america and traveled there a little bit and there's google of course mm. so so i set set it in america used american spellings um and that gave me a, access to a bigger market straight away i had someone on facebook ask me if it's a cynical uh, money-making ploy to to write in American English and and I answered well I just I'll take out the word cynical yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah if there's <laughs> you know, it's a loaded a, question a mass, isn't it is that yeah, advert just a cynical attempt to sell this lawnmower um, yeah, exactly well, it, <laughs> I was trying to sell more copies yes, yes yeah, yeah. Uh, okay I'm holding my hand yeah, up yeah guilty. I would yeah. that that was something I was I was aiming to do rather yeah. than fewer copies and retain my my integrity <laughs> for being somehow. British, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, setting it in Britain and writing in British English again. Uh, I think my writing got better, uh, but then but then again, the more you write, the better better you get, hopefully. Um, but I think it limited sales, certainly to the American audience. Uh, maybe I was asking a, a bit much. I don't want to generalise really because I've got plenty of American readers who mm. who love that series. Uh, but maybe they were less willing to take that chance from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it did. I mean, that one got, did really well on Audible, particularly, actually, strangely enough. Uh, uh, they ran a promotion on that, got to number one for a couple of days in the UK, the first in that series. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a well loved series. And again, it was, I think that's a, it's a, it's a really satisfying series. I'm, I'm really pleased with the way that one turned out. Um, but yeah, I limited my my market. I think by setting a science fiction superhero book in Britain. Uh, but there you go. You know, you you at the time I was still trying things and just my you know the next thirty ideas, looking in the notebook, and go, oh, this is going to be fun. I'm going to write this. Uh, so that was, and that carried on. After that, I wrote a standalone dark fantasy book. Right. With my career progression, yeah. <laughs> you know, carefully mapped out. Yeah. What's next? Okay, so you've had a massively successful series that you wrote in American English, set in America, uh, with aliens and nanotechnology. Then a, a less successful, but very happy, you know, I was very happy with it, series set in Britain, superhero, which has done really well in this country. Uh, so what you really need to write next, obviously, is a standalone dark fantasy, uh, a, a, where the only book you could compare it to, I think, is probably Clive Barker's Weave World. Right. Which um, he didn't write another one like that no. afterwards. So this is clearly the book you told me. <laughs> yeah, your readers were expecting you to write. So yeah, um, and that was a standalone. And when, when did the the book that won the Kindle Storyteller Award? When did that hover? That was the, the next one. And again, if you're that, that, you want to see where my thinking was going, then I think at that point I finally thought, well, okay. I've written lots of words now. I've written uh, eight books and I know how to structure a, a story. Uh, and I'm very, my, my reading is extremely broad and I've written, I've read quite a lot of psychological thrillers and I enjoyed the, the format and I had 
one of those 30 ideas was one that just kept coming back to me and nagging at me. Uh, and I thought, okay, I know it's, this is a stupid idea to write another standalone. What I should be doing is writing a science fiction series now. Um, and I had one, a nine book series in my, in my head and I started to make notes on that and uh, starting to do things sensibly. But this bloody idea, <laughs> I just couldn't get it out of my head. And I thought, right, okay, okay. So standalone, uh, it'll take me you know, a couple of months to write a draft of it. I'll see how it, how it looks, knock it into shape. Um, try and make it, I mean, I always think, feel like writing, I know I'm not the first to say this, is, is you get this wonderful idea and it looks perfect and then you just systematically destroy it. Mm. Um, but I ended up with something that still looked vaguely like that lovely idea at the end. And and then a couple of drafts later, I was, I thought, yeah, this is actually, it really works well, but it's a thriller, it's a massive market compared to sci-fi. It's, is this it's, the picture uh, on the fridge? Yeah. Yeah. So... So that was, and I like the title as well. That was the other thing. The title was there from the beginning. Yes. Yeah, the title's yeah. great. And you've got a tagline on the on the cover as well. Um, so this was was a one-off? Well, I guess it has to be. <clears throat> Those psychological thrillers that usually end in a, that have a death or and a conclusion tend to be psych- uh, standalone, except, of course, you could use the detective or something or a character again. Yeah, I mean, I had this one, actually, I did send out to a couple of agents and I had some correspondence with a couple as well and and one of them said there's a is there any way you can mm. make make this into a into a series you know i really like it is there, is there anything you can do is there a character you can bring through and there is a, a journalist in the picture in the fridge called patrice martino italian american and he's he's a fun character he's definitely got a life of his own so that was the possibility but it would have been a very tentative link really mm. although he's uh he's been in my mind recently with the series i'm writing now so uh, okay. there's a po- possibility that he might actually resurface but no i felt like it had to be a standalone that one it's just uh i knew how it was gonna end and i didn't think there was really any no coming back from that <laughs> but it, it won you the award um which you know was a uh, i'm sure an enormous fillip to you in terms of um uh, of believing that your writing is good and obviously you had evidence from sales as well uh, and then after that I know you you, you you know you have been thinking commercially I mean cynically Ian you've been thinking I know ter- crazy isn't it yeah cynically you've been thinking about selling books rather than just writing them for your own pleasure and, and sitting there uh, and your conclusion I think was to go down the thriller route yeah well I yeah I'm a massive uh, Lee Child fan um, I know Mark is. Uh, I, I believe he may have targeted some of his advertising. Possibly, the, the some similarities. I don't know. Yeah, um, and I love those books. And uh, it's really, I, I think I've sort of fell in love with those books since becoming a writer. I, I wasn't reading them before, and I just picked one up and then read all of them. Uh, and it, I thought they were so so well done. And what. And then with my professional writer's head on, I was thinking, if you've got a character that can go from book to book to book uh, that readers fall in love with, then you're onto a winner, aren't you? And Lee Child with his one book every year. Mm. You know, September the 1st, uh, he sits down. Yeah, although that would drive me nuts. Uh, to yeah. Only to do one a year, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but there you go. And of course, Mark with John Milton. So you've if you can find that character that can go on through books without starting to look like it's wearing thin and readers always, you know, if you read sometimes book 1920 of a series, you, you look at the reviews and you're of various long running thrillers and uh, you'll, you'll start to see doubts creeping in from readers saying, well, I'm just wondering now, you know, yeah, <laughs> if we're just retreading old ground. Uh, but there are some characters that seem to be able to just s- sustain that forever. And there's something to be said for, I mean, we, we talk a lot in our house about James Bond for some reason. My boy's yeah. really into the films. So we talk a lot about the fami- familiarity. Oh God, I can't speak today. It's Monday morning. <laughs> Putting on a pair of socks, basically, that you are comfortable, a pair of slippers that are comfortable, which is what a James Bond film has been, even up until now. And even now with all the time and money, they know it's a big 
you know, it's going to make money. It's very rare you have a film franchise where you're basically guaranteed that Mm. it's going to make money. And even with that, they still tread out basically the same evil baddie who's going to take over the world. And Bond gets caught and prison and, and brought to the point of death and then saves the day. And I'm thinking, do something different. Do something different. You know, have you know, have a three film series where it's young Bond before he joined the, the Secret Service, or he's retired and he's got some daughter who turned up from the middle. And, you know, do so, but they don't. But there's, they know what they're doing, right? So we go on and on about we've got to do it differently. But actually, the message we get from readers and film viewers in this case is they want the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a. I mean, there's a reason why you keep seeing sequels. Yeah. in Hollywood and, and critics moan about it and audiences moan about it, but they go. Yeah. Uh, Familiarity so is, is, is a key factor. I think it's actually a psychological factor in why we buy certain brands in the supermarket as well, isn't it? It's the same, probably the same psychology that knowing what you're going to get. And we all get that. Sometimes you go through Netflix, or whatever, work out what film you're going to watch. And you often make a safe choice. If you see key yeah. indicators of something you've seen before, like Will Ferrell comedy or something like that, that's why people open are able to open films and make money. It's a whole psychology around this. So is that, is that we've talked about this a lot on the podcast about it's a mistake quite often to try to be different commercially is a mistake. Yeah. I mean, it's that's that you, you kind of put your finger on the tension there of, of doing what we do, I think, because there's a the creative side, the artistic temperament not temperament exactly but the the artistic imperative you know it drives you is, is saying i want to create something i want to do something exciting i want to do something that makes me excited uh but then you also want to make a living yeah uh, and satisfy readers so in fact the blurred lands so my dark fantasy it's a great example that's um is probably some of the, my best writing is in that book and and uh it's it's a sold fewer than any other book I, I wrote. Um, but it's the best reviewed <laughs> by, by all, all 12 of the people who read it. <laughs> You've Absolutely got 132 it, reviews on .co.uk. So <laughs> yeah. there okay, are it's at not, least 132 people read it. Yeah, no, it's, it did okay. I mean, I'm, okay, I'm exaggerating, but um, yeah. yeah, it did. It did fine. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's almost like I limited the market before even getting it out there it's yeah it's i think if more people came through the door and gave it a go then they'd be pleasantly surprised but uh but it very much is dark fantasy there are monsters there are suggestions of the supernatural more than suggestions you know there are Mm. there are there are gods there are all sorts of things in there the kitchen sink makes a brief appearance yes uh, in a in a spooky (laughs) aside uh but it's also about grief, you know, so it's it's actually a it's a book I'm proud of. But commercially, you know, my commercial head had taken a little holiday at that point and came back and went, what have you done? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's, so a, there's a lack of cynicism in writing this. And we yes, yeah, what are you cynical. doing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so you, but one choice, I guess, was open to you. I mean, that conversation you had with the agent about finding a character, a recurring character for the psychological thriller. But one option for you is just to write a series of standalone, quite similar psychological thrillers. You don't necessarily need there to be the same uh, character for that to become a series. The difference between series and serials in there, but you know, yeah. to, to market them together, that must have been an option for you. Yeah, there's. Uh, if you look at someone like Mark Edwards, uh, I think it's with Thomas and Mercer, and that's what he does. Uh, they're all standalone, but they're they're all psychological thrillers, and they're very recognisable in their style. Uh, they're, that familiarity is there with his stuff. Definitely. You know, you, yeah. you know what you're getting into. So did you think about that? Yeah, um, I did. And I've got, I have a few psychological thriller ideas. I don't think I could sustain writing three or four okay. psychological thrillers a year. Um, I think I would get bored and and that boredom would come through in my writing. The thing with the picture on the fridge was it was such a good idea that it wouldn't let go of me. And, uh, I do have one other psychological thriller idea, but it's similarly keeps coming back. So I imagine at some point you're right. Another that. standalone yeah. psychological thriller, but my the sort of creative and commercial side to try and satisfy both of them. That's the, the Holy grail. So that idea of having a Jack Reacher or John Mills, you know, a character that can, or James Bond can sustain 
but with the, the Sainsbury twist, which uh, if you read any of my books, I do like to kind of play with conventions a little bit. And um, it, it's doing that, but not doing it, not going too far, I think is the, is the trick. And when I look at World Walker and how well that did, I can see my instincts were very good there. Uh, we're just taking things so, so far and not not yeah. too far keeping people within the framework so so your decision in the end was this thriller series now as we're speaking now it's not being released so i can't look at it on amazon but i know we've had a conversation a few weeks ago about this and you're you're close to the release point so tell us about this series and what planning's gone into it well i, I was starting from i think i've been waiting for a the last couple of years to, for an idea for a character that would be able to do this and there's no point in even getting it started unless you've got the character has to come first with this i think for me um and i i had an idea for a character um must have been february this year i think i'd started a i did the thing that you shouldn't do really i'd got thirty nine thousand words into a a thriller with the working title of how to train your assassin which is actually a could also be a series a female protagonist um and it's a lot of fun and a, a really good idea so i was just expecting to carry on and finish that because I, I don't abandon things halfway through but then i got this idea and i couldn't go back to the, to the other one but it was it was so insistent and such a strong idea i thought um i'd it, it's one of those ones when i as soon as i had the idea i thought i want to read this I want to read this character. Uh, I want to see this film. I want to see the TV series. You know, it was, it felt that good. So I just abandoned briefly. I thought, uh, I mean, I will go back to the other one, but I just started making notes and I thought, yeah, this is, I've just got to write this. It was such a strong idea. Um, and I met, I mean, I've got a lovely quote from from Mark Dawson to stick on the top of the blurb, actually. Excellent, because um, he's read uh, the first. You know, he's read the, the an earlier draft of this, um, and it's uh, he says uh, Jekyll and Hyde meets Jack Reacher is. Ooh, and that's okay. the, so you've got a, a psychological, a, a, a psychiatric issue with your your protagonist. Well, there is, yeah, there's uh, the protagonist is. A very interesting character. Okay. Yeah. Tom 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 Lewis, who's uh thirty-two years old and he's he's um he's built like Jack Reacher. He's a massive, massive guy, but naturally massive. But he's he suffered uh brain damage as a twelve year old when he was shot in the head and, and left for dead and his parents were murdered. Um and in fact he was to all intents and purposes, everyone thought he was dead because the people who shot his parents would have liked to have wiped out the whole family. So it, it was his death was announced. And we're now 20 years later and he can barely speak. He can't read or write. He works on a building site. Uh, but there's another side to Tom. And uh, the people who murdered his family are getting picked off one by one. Right. So it's a nice, in a, on one on the one hand, it's a nice straightforward revenge thriller, which I've, I love a good revenge thriller. It has yes. to be good. It has to yeah. grab me. But it's like that thing you're saying, you know where you are. You know, if you mm. think, oh, great. So people have done very bad things and we're going to see them get their comeuppance during the book. Uh, but the other side to this is the main character is there are two sides to him. And we feel differently about the two sides. And as we get to know him, I... And I've, I mean, it's been out with beta readers. It's the advanced reader copies have come out. The comments are back, and they're all saying the things that I hope they would say, which is that they they want him to succeed. They 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 love the Tom side of him, and they feel almost maternal towards him, and they're terrified of the other side. Right. <laughs> but but they're with him all the way. It's like like you would be with Reacher, you know, uh, or John Milton or or James Bond. Uh you want them to to succeed and have you done um is there some medical research you've done in terms of um a schizophrenia it's called isn't it the split personality or have you left this a little bit more fictional and I've, I've left it a little bit more open at the moment there are i haven't gone too deeply into i yeah i have done research and it's not really schizophrenia actually okay um, and it's not multiple personalities. There's a new term for it medically, and I've 
I should have written that down. Okay. So it's, it's on one of my 300 tabs that are open yeah. in my research. <laughs> um, okay. but, right. but yes, uh, there is a it medical is. condition, but it's also, if you think of the original Jekyll and Hyde, there's a, uh, you know, he drinks a potion and he yes. becomes, it's all his worst quality. It's like the filter goes off, <laughs> it gets removed completely. Um, and he goes back to like a savage almost. Well, right. this is a bit different. I mean, it's called Bedlam Boy, and that's what this character oh, okay. calls himself. Okay. And uh, but he he's the one who's got all the intelligence as well. You know, right. Tom. It's a Tom is the kind of guy. Who, he's lovely. People take advantage of him. Yeah. He he moves snails off the path when before walking up the front uh, to the front of his house, so okay. he won't accidentally step on them. That's the guy he is. But Bedlam Boy is uh if you think someone want is going to take on a criminal organization and try and pick them off uh they're going to need to be extremely intelligent as well as brutal and uh well trained he also disappeared for seven there's seven missing years in his background okay that we know nothing about as readers so there's, uh, yeah exactly and there's lots to, to come so you've got book one coming out i think um on the 17th of july that's the plan at the moment. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll, that, the interview will probably go out after that point. So hopefully people, even if that plan's shifted a bit, will be able to find oh, it. Well, it'll be earlier, if not. So oh, earlier, yeah, if not. Okay. Be out. And in terms of marketing, so we, we, in the little bit of time we've got left, uh, Ian, let me just ask you how your marketing has evolved through through that story. Um, uh, you started off doing the classic thing and well done to you, uploading it and, in, and watching money coming in, which is fantastic. It doesn't happen to everyone. Um, and at some point, have you started getting a handle on the on the ad side of things and list mailing list and so on? Yeah, more on the mailing list than the ad side, and the, my focus is now more on on the mailing list. But you know, advertising is happening. Uh, this is something I've always struggled with. Uh, I love the writing process. I, I actually enjoy getting the covers together and writing the blurbs and all of that as well. But the marketing thing, uh, my my eyes glaze over, my brain starts to turn to mush, and it's it's not pretty. So I've got someone doing it for me at the moment, and this we'll see how that goes. Um, so that's the plan at the moment. But I have done some things differently this time, which hopefully will will help with the sales. Um, and I definitely want to build up the mailing list. So I've written a reader magnet, which is I thought I was. I'll write a short story about this character and it'll be about two to 3000 words. It ended up being over 8,000 words. Uh, and it's a great fun episode called the Las Vegas driving lesson. So I'm giving that away to my list this week. And um, in the back of each book, of course, will be a chance to sign up and, and get a copy of that. So I've, I've done that right this time. It's all ready to go as the book comes out instead of being an afterthought. Um, and I've done something quite, I mean, it is, this is an experiment and who knows how it'll go, but I saw the other thing that pushed me into writing this was uh, what Dean Koontz did with Amazon Publishing in America uh, at the end of last year, which was the Nameless series. Now I've, I like reading, I love short stories. I don't write short stories and I like novellas and I, I love episodic stories which is more often on TV now. I, you know, we all watch a lot of Netflix and Amazon Prime and HBO these days. So I like that you know, we're going to tell a story, but we're going to tell it in six episodes. And that's what with Nameless, Dean Koontz did. And it's been massively successful. And it's, uh, they're a quid each. And I think they're about 15,000 words average uh, each episode. Now, as we know, a quid is no good because mm. you're really giving yourself a mountain to climb uh, by having that 35% royalty rate. But I wrote six episodes. I, I wanted to write it like a TV series. Um, I write visually anyway. I see every, it's like watching camera angles. That's how I, I write and then inside the, cat, the character's head. So I wrote the arc of a six episode. I want a whole story told, but then I, I wrote episodically so we've got six episodes going going through. And so that I can give myself a chance of making some money, I've packaged them into three novella length books. So it's two episodes in each book. Right. So, so you can you charge your six two ninety nine at least to get the seventy percent. Well, I was going to do one ninety nine uh, and two two ninety nine dollars. Yeah, 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 and one pound ninety nine in in UK, so that I can get the 
that's hit the 70 percent royalty rate um but still do the it's still divided into two parts in each book so you still get your six episodes but you're reading two at a time before the next one comes out okay so it's, it's an experiment yeah I kept, so that's the minimum price i can charge and still get my 70 yes. percent um and i know i can write m many more like this as well that's the uh, quite a lot that's of, not quite a lot of planning involved in this Yes. In terms of the stories, this is not one where you can just play with and think, I think I might do this in book three. You, If you're going to do this, you've got to know what book three, four, five, and six have in them at the beginning. Yeah, so it's it's very much, um, I'm calling it in my head, it, this is season one. Okay. So books, it's Bedlam Boy 1, Bedlam Boy 2, Bedlam Boy 3, and the, the covers, instead of having the subtitles on the covers, that's what I've gone for. So it's very simple when you see it, and the colours... So, will show you this is a complete story um, told across these six episodes. And so when four, five, and six come out, in my head, that's season two. And I might even say season two of Pedal and Boy, you know, um, where I think he'll be going to America. Okay. I have some, I have a few pages of ideas for this already, but it, again, ep episodic nature. So it'll be six episodes telling a one story, but like, Again, like that, uh, like a TV series where each episode has has its own pace, has its own arc, um, but drives you forward into the other episodes. So it's they're not standalone episodes. You right. won't read one and think, "I'm done with this now." Uh, they they are propelling you through the first six episodes. And there is a there is a small danger there that some people do react badly to get into the end of a book and realize they've got to buy the next book. Um, I don't really understand that because it's like a great thing to, you know, you wouldn't say that about a TV series, uh, even if you buy the episodes individually on, on Amazon. But you do get, you will get maybe some disgruntled readers, you think? Yeah, and I, I'm quite thin-skinned. Um, I, I I always get over it. It's fine, but, you know, I will there will be some pacing up and down and some, and some swearing. And, uh, <laughs> well, that's okay. Uh, I, it's, it's a weird thing because I like reading very long books and I like reading very short books and everything in between. And the only grounds I could think of for anyone being disgruntled would be as if they feel they've been misled in any way. And I'm being very careful and yes, to make it clear. I've I, the word novellas there. I said short punchy reads, you know, I'm yep. doing everything I can to let people know what this is. It's and in terms of the work I've put in, more work has gone into these three books than what has gone into any of the novels yeah. because of that, the way the stories have been written. And uh, the how many words the are they? Uh, they're between, so they're between about 25 to 30,000 per novella. So, okay. But that's two episodes. So it's about 50,000 plus word, excuse me, words for two ninety nine each time. So no, it's so around 30,000 for two ninety nine dollars Oh, sorry. So about 15 per, episode yeah, about yes average 15 per episode i'm with yeah. you yeah, yeah. Um, so okay. slightly under um and it's i mean i think the final one is is slightly shorter than that just because it's uh accelerating towards the satisfying end but of course you get the eight thousand word story for free and there you go yeah <laughs> to get you going on, on top of that the last um, so, driving lesson yeah i feel like amazon are, um I don't think Amazon, it's hard to know because it's such an opaque sort of company in many ways, but they, when they do something new and they keep, and they do innovate and, yeah. and the Dean Koontz Nameless series is an example of that, but it's not the first time they've tried it. And there's a whole short read section to Amazon, which is very busy now um, and is definitely getting livelier all the time. Um, so I think that they've seen something. You know, yeah. Yeah trying to get more books into this they're trying to promote this uh, shorter read idea and i know as a reader if i'm reading something which i, I can't believe i'm saying this but i will read on my phone now mm. so i will be somewhere where i haven't got the kindle uh, yeah or the ipad or whatever and i'll read on my phone i do and, the same although i like you i hate it yeah i'm not comfortable with it but i much prefer having the kindle um do you do you go into ku will you go into ku with these i always have 
yeah um with every book and i've i've done well in ku yeah um, but so yes I, I i i'm certainly planning on it for this and i'm just going to see how it goes I'm, I'm certainly open to the idea of going wide um if it's the right thing to do uh, and this is something new so i'll see i'll try and be led by by sales and by what people are telling me and yeah it's, it's, i suppose this it, is it will be slightly tougher in ku because of the page length you know that so the word count over the whole series if i've got this right is about 90 to 100 thousand words across the whole series yeah so it's about uh i think it's about 85 over the first three books so uh it's so yeah it's like a, a full-length novel so you, over the, the trilogy yes yeah so you've got Basically, you could, you know, in terms of KU reads, it won't really matter how you've done it up. People, you're being paid by the page. Well, that's, yeah, and that's another thing that I think with the, the pricing model is that uh, if you're in KU, yeah. it, it makes no difference. Doesn't matter. You, you just yeah. get, you get a couple of extra pretty covers to look at. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Good. Oh, well, uh, Ian, it's, it's really interesting talking to you. Uh, we have to follow this up because I think a lot of people will be very, will be intrigued by the approach to the sort of shorter episodic. Um, uh, it seems very zeitgeist, as you say, everyone's sort of consuming TV like this uh, all the time mm. uh, at the moment. And there's there's been a huge amount of um, very successful novel adaptations. I'm thinking of the uh, Big Little Lies turned into these episodic format and it works brilliantly. I mean, that was a fantastic series. We're watching Little Fires Everywhere now, which is a very similar thing. So it seems very zeitgeist to me, this approach. Yeah. I'm not sure if I like being zeitgeist or <laughs> not, James. But all I can say is it's really good, really good fun to write that way. And it's different. And it's, it feels like a, a mixture between, I mean, I have written scripts. You know, I've been in BBC meetings before where something's gone on a certain got to a certain level where you get invited in and talk through scripts i've even had a read through of a pilot episode or something so it's i've been on that side of the mm. fence and i i enjoy writing fiction on the page far more than scripts um, far more yeah. but this way that side of pacing it that way um has been such fun to do and really engaging as a and i think that comes through in the writing so well yeah yeah, follow it up. Let's see. You're yeah. either, I'll be I'll be here with the beard. I'll be back, and there'll yeah. be a bottle of vodka next. Look, it's slightly older. Yeah, or, a lot older. Or <laughs> you'll be in this Armani suit. So I haven't got time to talk to you, Blatch. Well, that's how I started this interview, of course. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, Ian, look, really lovely to catch up with you. Congratulations again on the on the win, and just you know, fingers crossed and, and best wishes with this series. Uh, I have a feeling it's going to do well, but we'll we'll see. We'll see. Thanks, James. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. So that's Ian. Sainsbury. Uh, great to have Ian on the show. We definitely wish him the very best of luck with that. We'll be watching it very carefully. Um, we've had sort of a commercial chat with Ian as well in the background about some of this as well. So we'd be, be very interested in how that works out for him. Um, I would say, I mean, I one of the reasons I love reading novels, and funny enough, I, we've been throwing out books recently, and I came with some books I read in the 1980s when I was a kid, and I did love those big doorstep books. I read those big, uh, very thick books. And you feel like you've lived a bit of a life in a big, long novel where lots happen. And that's what I love. I love feeling a bit bereft after I've finished a big novel. And I worry that in twenty to 30,000 words that you can't get that level of depth. You can't produce that kind of life-changing feel, or at least the characters in the in the book of whose lives have changed. Can you do that, do you think, in that time? That but they're different, different experiences, aren't they? So, you know, it's uh, a, a shorter novella is more like... A... A snack, really, I guess, but it doesn't have to be a snack that isn't nutritious, it, you know. And anyway, it can just be something that you enjoy, pick up and enjoy, put down again, forget about. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, with the the kind of thicker novels, and I know, you know, I've I've got a few of those that I remember quite fondly as well. Um, you you get much the canvas is much broader, and you get to do a lot more in terms of characterization and and perhaps chronology and all, all of that kind of stuff it's you have more scope to play around with things that you wouldn't have with the short fiction but you know they i don't think they need to be neither is necessarily better than the other they offer different yeah. um different things to different readers at different times and um i think there's there's enough room in the market for all kinds of fiction 
which, you know, you know, with your three hundred fifty thousand word, yeah, <laughs> well, you can see, but, you, know. you can see why I want people's lives to change. Um, good. Okay. Well, let's not move on to that subject. I've even got a temperature warning on my camera with my air conditioning on. That's that's what's happening in the UK today. Everything, everything melts. Um, it's hot. Good. Okay, look, thank you very much indeed to our guest, Ian. Uh, lovely to have you on. Uh, I did trail ahead the Marie Force interview. That is going to come, I think, probably in September. Uh, I'm waiting. For, she's got a bit of a... Uh, she did tell me after the interview she has a bit of a public milestone coming up in the next few weeks. So I think we'll try and coincide it with that. Um, good. That's it. You can go and enjoy the sunshine now, Mark. Got big plans for the weekend. It's barbecue tonight, so I'm going to be going to uh, Marks and Spencer's to buy some salad. That's how exciting my life is this afternoon. And then I'll be um, burning everything this evening, yeah. and the pool might be open. I think there'll be some some pool action this evening. Yeah, it's quite nice it's, as it's nice now, and I think the, the forecast is very nice for the next few days. So um, we're going to be enjoying our brief English summer before it gets <laughs> grim again in a week's yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that is the downside of this. We do love our warm days, but they are not guaranteed in this country. You are not just going to have salad in your barbecue. You're going to have copious amounts of meat, I assume. There may be some meat, yes. Okay. Good. Apologies to vegans and vegetarians yes. out there. there. There might be a little bit of meat. It's entirely possible. No animals were harmed. Well, apart from all the animals <laughs> that are harmed for the barbecue. Good. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. All that leaves me to say is that it's a goodbye from him and a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.